Welcome to Sword and Shield, the official podcast of the 960th Cyberspace Wing. Join us for insight, knowledge, mentorship, and some fun as we discuss relevant topics in and around our wing. Please understand that the views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of the U.S. Air Force nor the Air Force Reserve, and no endorsement of any particular person or business is ever intended. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Sword and Shield podcast. I'm Colonel Rick Erich, 960th Cyberspace Wing Commander, and today we have three special guests. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Megan Kell. I go by Pom Pom. I'm the 717th Commander. Captain Brian Fry from the 426 Network Warfare Squadron. Casey Erich, 960th Cyberspace Wing Key Spouse Mentor. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about a topic that I feel very passionate about and that we are starting to be leaders in AFRC and Air Force Reserve Command. And I'm excited about what we're taking it and, and the outreach we've done. And that's digital force protection. And so the, the folks we have today are considered our experts and AFRC experts in, in the digital force protection business and digital literacy. And so I'm really excited to have them share with you really what this is all about and then and then at the end it's the hook so the hook is for you to stay around at the end in order to learn what you can do to um, help yourself out and your family out be digital literate and and really i think for me this topic is a readiness issue and and our families need to be ready and so um i'll start with you megan kind of give us a little bit of background about what digital force protection is and where it kind of started for us and for you. Yes, sir. Thank you. So digital force protection is very simply a combination of influence resistance and social media hygiene. So influence resistance is understanding that there's active influence operations against us uh, on a daily basis that may or may not reach us and how to be digitally literate, uh, how to have countermeasures against those, etc., how to resist those influence operations. And social media hygiene are things like settings uh, within your social media apps or even on your Android or Apple phones. Um, so very simply, that's what digital force protection is. It started a few years ago when uh, General Kabinik, the IMA, to the uh, Commander Air Force Reserve Command at the time, General Scobie, came to me and said, have you seen Social Dilemma? And I said, no, ma'am. And she said, go home and watch it and tell me what we can do to get after this threat because we see it as a resiliency issue. General Scobie had started the Developing Resilient Leaders initiative, and she um, she took that very seriously, and there were several different um, ways that she implemented that, and one of those was through digital force protection, of which I got to lead the charge and develop the program, and I feel very close to it, but that was that was the start of it, was as a resiliency program at the MAGCOM level, started with a, a documentary on Netflix, sir. Yeah, um, all great programs start from a problem, and, and a hard problem to solve. And, and we put really smart people using their brains to try to solve that problem, and then we try to um, ensure the masses understand how we can counter that. And so um, you're the grandmother, the mother, like, of all digital force protection. Um, I heard it. I bought in immediately for it. I wanted to do something in our wing. I wanted to push um, this narrative to defend and protect and have our families be smart and, and from an OPSEC, from a readiness and all these things, it's really important for me that, that our folks have all the information they need. And so we look for somebody within the wing to um, kind of continue the legacy. And, you know, you're a commander. I want you to command first. I know mm-hmm. you're passionate about this topic. But we need, we need, we need to create uh, a following and uh, a cadre of people that can continue to do that. And so Captain Fry from the 426 stepped up for us and, and is, um, is learning under your, under your tutelage and really been a key partner here. So, Brian, what is digital force protection to you and how do you see it from your perspective? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, So I come from a a cybersecurity background. So 426, we're defending the AFNET. And I think that shares significant overlap with digital force protection, where I think we're trying to defend that cognitive realm, the space between your ears, you know, our airmen's thoughts and minds. Uh, I got interested in this because I read a book by Thomas Ridd called Active Measures, uh, A History of Disinformation. And 
uh, all the, the dirty tricks that the KGB were playing throughout the Cold War to uh, influence our thoughts. And, you know, in the world of today where, you know, our computers, our devices, our social media gives the, our adversaries a direct line to the information that our troops are consuming, I think this is uh, more important than ever to educate and teach our airmen how to recognize, you know, maybe this is something to, to think twice about and to, to stay safe online. Yeah, well, you know, when we talk about mentoring, mentoring up and down, and so we had a discussion about this. You mentioned your passion for it. You mentioned active measures. There on my book, on my, on my table right there on top, is the book Active Measures that I read because you told me about it. Yes, and it is a fascinating, it's a hard read. There's so much details in there, but I recommend it as a book. If you have more interest in this, it's really the beginning of disinformation from Russia's perspective a long time ago. And it gives you a good context about where where we are now and how they got there. And and so from the family perspective, families are targets as well. And so, Casey, why is this important for um, our, our families and our extended families um, to have this knowledge? So I, I think as civilians, uh, so in in the wing, you all as members see it every day. Um, and, and there's a lot that you all can't talk about. Um, <laughs> yes. But like when I first heard the presentation that Megan gave, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like amazing. And we need to share this with our families because a lot of times um, the families go right to social media. Um, you know, when, because that's, that's their way to connect a lot of times. And, and they don't necessarily think about the implications of some of the things they say. So like a a lot of the spouse pages that I'm on, they cut a new spouse to the area will come onto a Facebook page and they're like, hi, we're new to the area. My kids are, I've got two boys. One is seven, one is four. We live in the Alamo Ranch area. They like to play soccer and dance. And my husband is in security forces and this and that. And we came from here and I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) you just gave so many pieces of the puzzle to so many people that you have no idea idea who they are and i think it's because they don't they don't realize the implications of where all that's going for they're just looking to make a connection Mm -hmm. um and and so uh they don't see it as, as being problematic they just know they want to connect with somebody and and to find that perfect person that's a good fit for their children, um, they just throw it out there to anybody that will respond. Now, are they likely just going to get somebody to be a friend? Probably. But, I mean, there might be nefarious people out there that are like, ooh, look at all these goodies I just got. <laughs> so that's that's where I decided that I was like, we need to get this in the hands of our families is because they just don't, they don't know what they don't know. And I, I think the presentation by Captain Fry and, and Lieutenant Colonel Kell, it, I mean, it provides a lot of information and like, oh my gosh, enlightening moments. I appreciate that. That's good to know. And you know, it's not just families that do that. Social media is a place where you can pridefully talk about yourself and your families. It's a place to connect. You said it when you said they go there to connect. The number one reason we're on social media is for connectedness. And ironically, that digital relationship will sometimes take the place of the physical one, right? Right. Um, So there's a balance. You know, never would we advocate get off of social media, but that there's a balance. And there's also an educated way to go about, you know, posting to see what others' interests are in a minor way without putting everything out there and risking yourself um, with digital force protection or the mission with OPSEC. You know, OPSEC mm-hmm. is very closely aligned to digital, for, aligned to digital force protection. Um, you know, what you just mentioned, I think, is a digital force protection risk and also an OPSEC risk because mm-hmm. the OPSEC is mission-focused. A friend of mine who's a very, very proud pilot squadron commander put a wonderful amount of information recently about their recent deployment I'm I'm concerned for him and his unit and their families, you know, because of the OPSEC piece of that, you know. So I think it's just important that, um, you know, we have the conversation, right. that we just talk about it, that we have disagreements and that we get better from it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, Brian, how would, um, 
how can we help our airmen and their families be a harder target? Yeah, I think we've we've built this program around some key techniques to to make yourself a harder target. We've I think broken that up into to two main buckets. You know, the first I'll say is critical thinking. So when you're online, taking time, especially when something is making you emotional, to step away, think about what we're consuming, uh, think about what we want to post in response to you know what's on there, and, and recognizing that hey, this might not be coming from a trustworthy source. Is this true? Can I fact check it? Uh, are they looking to have an emotional impact on me? So that that critical thinking is is one, and then two is making yourself a harder target, right? So. Taking the time, I know it, it can be a pain, but going through all those apps on your phone and all those memberships you have online to, to limit what you're putting out there about yourself, you know, looking at those privacy settings, uh, it can be some work, but I think it's really worth it to, to limit what we put out there because there can be some scary downstream impacts of, of oversharing online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a real easy way to go into Facebook in your privacy settings and be able to see what people see when they look at my profile. How much of my profile can they see? Um, is it important for me to share my birthday? Well, I appreciate birthday wishes. Um, I'd rather safeguard the date of my birthday as PII. That's a personal choice that I make. We all have our approach to this for sure, but we have to combat not only a red threat from China and Russia, but a blue threat of information inundation. Um, and bad practices like doom scrolling, you know, if it bleeds, it leads is a saying for a reason, you know, <laughs> yeah. and we, we, we will look at things that interest us, but we don't necessarily want to be shown those over and over again. And those can have a negative physiological impact on us. They can increase our cortisol levels, um, which, which add to the stress and that blue threat lowers our defenses over time, whether it's self-inflicted or whether it's inflicted by a, an, a social media company. Uh, and then the red actors can come in and with their influence operations have a bigger impact. So it's really just about being that harder target, like you said. So, yeah. I'm, uh, I was fascinated um, by the, the, sci the science behind some of this, right, that you guys presented. I know you've been doing this a while, so you kind of shape it. And it, you, to keep it relevant, you've done a really good job of that. But um, the context about scrolling online is similar or has some of the same effects as like like you said today brian nicotine alcohol and gambling right and so um, i think for me that reshapes it and maybe that's a better way to have a conversation with your children and brian you said it again like we don't let our children have that until certain age limits are regulated by our government and even then it's not safe but at least Closer to the point where they're more adultish, that they can make their own decision, make an informed decision. Right. I think it is all about the children. I had a first sergeant come to me with his 13-year-old after this and said, is there anything out there that can educate? I've, I've kept her from online. She feels somewhat disconnected, which is totally fair because all of her friends are online. How do we educate her friends in two minutes or less so that they can see that a balance is required? You know, so I think that's our next charge or are the children to be more deliberate about engaging the children and, and offering, um, you know, tips and tricks for their parents and them. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I'll say my, my girls are two and four, so I haven't had to confront this problem yet, but how have the, the two of you, you know, talked to your family about staying safe online? Yeah, it's a good question, Casey. <laughs> it is. <laughs> we, we have, we have uh, almost daily conversations about social media and, 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 trying to be safe and be smart. And I know um, Rick has had primarily a lot of conversations with our adult son, who's 23, likes Twitter, likes to retweet things regularly, um, who his dad is on Twitter, follows him and says, why did you retweet that? And he's like, because I thought it was funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's his answer. Mm -hmm. and And it's like, you realize this is a topic that some people may not see the, the funny in that and what kind of an impact is that going to have on you down the road. Um, and so it's conversations like that that we have with them uh, the, frequently about the importance of just trying to think. Again, you know, it comes back to that. We've talked a lot about critical thinking today and think 
before you push the button because you don't know what's going to happen from that button push down the road. And for me, it's about the opportunity to have a deliberate discussion, mm -hmm. right? I'm just dad. What do I know? I know you work in cyber, and, and, and Casey says all the time that we in, we in uniform have access to more information that we can't share with families, and they feel disconnected from that. So for us trying to find a way to have a discussion in this space to shape the message and narrative about why there's risk there, and, and, and frankly, sometimes I'm the doomsayer on that end to try to get their attention, right, about why it's important. Um, we let our kids have social media, we, we, we try to monitor it, and we try to have conversations about it and critically think. And I like to ask the question why and just keep asking the why, right, and get to a point where they get frustrated at that. And I said, okay, we just had a non-meaningful conversation just like that meme or whatever that message. Or I like to ask them, is it true? Do you believe it? Prove it. Find me another source that says that that's true or that do doesn't have an impact on somebody else and it's really important because what you're doing is bringing together the digital and the physical environment and that's what we're trying to um, kind of press upon the audience is that we don't want you to leave the physical environment searching for a digital relationship we don't want your attention spans to shrink because you're watching videos that are only one minute long we want you to have those deliberate discussions you know we want you to take a personal inventory when you read something that is emotionally disturbing and before you repost it, you know, potentially exposing your friends and family to more disinformation just because you were saying it wasn't true, <laughs> you stop and you think about the ramifications of that. So I think um, I think that that's that's a model way to go about it. Let's have a discussion about it. You know, it doesn't need to be this wicked problem that we can't attack. It's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, I saw this weekend as part of the. I think it's the month of the military child right now. Mm -hmm. And, it is. and they had some really good content about mindfulness and taking time to, to think about how does this make me feel? You know, what's going on with my body? Is this, you know, am I having a reaction to what's what's going on? And I think that's, you know, that applies across, you know, into the online realm as well because that's kind of what you need to do. It's, it can be really hard. It's hard for me to, you know, when I get emotional to take a moment, think about what's going on, you know, in real world conversations and online. But uh, it's a skill that the more you practice, I think the better you get at it. Yeah, and True. And to that point, sorry, Case, no, uh, right. real quick, you said two and four-year-old, right? Like, I think you can practice some of this behavior now. When something happens in the physical world, like maybe sister pushes sister and falls down, and you say, how does that make you feel? Like, try to make them articulate that now so that in the future, when there is an interaction in a digital part of your world, that that's a natural way for them to think about, oh, that made me feel this way or that way. And it doesn't matter whether it's a meme or whether it's something that happens to you in the real world. Did I steal your... I can't remember now where I was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to... Oh, I was going to say, so in one of the videos that you showed in the digital force protection thing um, that in the presentations today, one of the videos um, had a picture of adults on the table. We've talked a lot about kids, but mm -hmm. like that picture had three adults sitting at a table and every single one of them was on a phone. So I think what's important as well is that we as adults, especially those of us that have children, have to be mindful of the amount of time that we spend on our screens as well. If we're preaching to our children, well, you need to put down your phone, but then then the vast majority of the time that we're with our children, we're on our phones as well. What are we showing to them? You know, we're saying, you know, it's do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. But I think in this aspect, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we're saying emotionally it is not good for them. And if it's emotionally not good for them, it's not good for us either in reality. I mean, and, and I think we really have to, like, um, be mindful um, of, of exhibiting a good control of being on our devices as well. Yeah, we have to model that behavior. That's I right. Think that's important. You know, that's timely. At the zero nine hundred showing, um, there was a gentleman at the at at the uh, briefing with his family, and he used a term that he said was common, but I hadn't heard it yet. Um, things are caught, not taught. It was something like that, and mm. what that essentially means is that the behavior that you model is going to resonate more with your child or with your friends than it will if you just say something, right? And so that's such an important point. It's easy to get wrapped up in. You know, we need to make sure that we focus on the children because they are important. They're an extremely important audience that's being targeted by social media. Mm -hmm. But 
we're just as vulnerable for it, you know. I mean, I'm on some Facebook groups that I have to kind of watch myself on because I might spend a little bit too much time on it. Um, but that's the balance that I strike. I choose to be on some social media platforms and not on others. Mm-hmm. But that's that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up, Casey. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, and can I, I mean, to change up a bit, the, the question I think we get asked the most about right now, what's in the news is, is this TikTok. What's going on with TikTok? People yeah. keep asking us <laughs> during these presentations. Colonel Cal, what do you, what do you think, what's going on with TikTok? So at the end of the day, the questions that we get are TikTok from the leadership. And then from the airmen that we give these briefings to, they say, well, there's other American companies that are just as bad, right? So I want to actually double down on your question and try to answer both. So TikTok, at the end of the day, we know that the CCP has access, unfettered access to all of the big tech uh, companies in China. And we know that TikTok is owned by a Chinese company. And although they claim that their information is stored on, or that our American information is served is stored on servers in U.S. backed up by Singapore, they're unwilling to prove that. So for all we know, all of our information is going to the CCP. Um, another problem are TikTok challenges. You know, some of them are very vandalizing. Some of them are teaching you to teach to um, to um, steal cars or. Um, put a penny in a light socket to see what happens, um, and it's it's downright dangerous. Not to mention it offers an influence platform um, that the CCP can utilize against us, where they tend to amplify words from what I call the popular pretties um, and not let those, those of us that have a more normal look about us um, have the stage as much. That impacts our self-esteem, um, but it also makes those people influencers. And with the right amount of information at the right time and place, they can leverage that at a future time in their, in their favor. Um, there's several other reasons that, that don't quite come to mind at the moment, but mainly it's that, yes, they have that access. Now, when you look at other companies like YouTube and Facebook, especially YouTube, they collect a lot of information. TikTok asks for more information from us than any other social media platform, hands down, whether it be our contacts, whether it be our keystroke patterns, GPS locations, etc. cetera. Um, YouTube is second to that, an American company, but YouTube doesn't provide that information to the CCP that we know of, um, whereas TikTok, it's more likely that that information is flowing to the CCP. So I, I would offer that there are, there are some dangers, and a lot of it is the danger of the unknown with TikTok, um, but that it tends to be better safe than sorry and, and to kind of wave off. I mean, I think it's telling that they were, it was recently banned from government devices and that uh, the CEO had some, had some trouble answering some questions on the Hill recently and on both sides of the aisle, while the media sometimes may try to politicize it, both sides of the aisle has some concerns with TikTok. So I think there's reason to watch it there. Um, I've heard some safeguards are to go to TikTok online rather than getting an account and doing it as an app, that that's a way to kind of safeguard yourself um, is by looking at those videos online, uh, putting a time limit on yourself, um, and then talking to your friends about maybe what they see, but but again, stepping away from, from that online. I feel like you teed me up, which I really appreciated, but I'm wondering if I missed anything. Did I miss anything? You know, the only other one I say is, they have between 40 and 60 million active daily users. A yeah. lot of people get their news primarily from TikTok. So, you know, would you be comfortable with the Chinese Communist Party owning the Washington Post, the New York Times, and, and getting your news from uh, a source that's controlled by a foreign government? So mm-hmm. we haven't quite seen what, what that can bring about. Uh, we've seen, I think, two years ago, they, they started to censor information on Tiananmen Square and on Tibet. So we know they have the capability to censor what we're putting out there on TikTok. So. And, and, and we know you guys have clearly demonstrated for us that what TikTok is inside China is different than what is exported to the rest of the world. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you, you kind of mentioned it, sir, where you know, our, our teenage population you know, have developing brains and, and aren't allowed to uh, drink alcohol or use nicotine or, or gamble. Well, in, in China, they have restricted TikTok access uh, to, I think it's 14 and up, and they set daily time limits on that population. And oh, by the way, they're not getting regular TikTok. It's an educational version that serves content like science experiments and, and history lessons uh, that are, are more beneficial than the things that our citizens are consuming. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely true. And, you know, we've heard it called before. Um, a spinach version is what goes to China, and we get the opium version because there are controls. There are, are There is a cognizance of protecting the children on that side. And then on this side, um, there's less... Um, less controls in place. So it's more of a discussion topic for what does the future look like? And when that plays out, when you look at what the future looks like and you ask you ask children in America versus China what they want to be when they grow up, you're getting astronaut in China and you're getting social media influencer in America. So what does that look like in five to ten years, right? That, uh, that, that caught like my in- attention. <laughs> when I heard that, when he laid it out that way, I was like, OMG. Mm-hmm. Yes, I you know I can see it, and that's their goal, right? They want to influence us, and and change our behavior, and and um, give them the upper hand in whatever whatever that is, whatever their end goal and intention is. And I think that to me is uh, is shocking, and we kind of see it playing out, right, with the number of um, the number of students that they bring over here to learn STEM, and like they've executed their strategic plan very well. And we have not, um, based on our way of life, we view things differently and value things differently, that we're at this point now where I think we need to go on the offensive and protect and defend and and tell everybody about um, the opportunities available and the decisions that we feel are important um, for people to protect and defend our family. And essentially, you know, democracy is what they're trying to, they're trying to change and trying trying to erode. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I mean, there was a time when we were a lot more cautious, and no one wants to be that scared, cautious, you know, Cold War time frame again. But there, there's reason to apply some of those measures now. There's reasons to be secretive, to be a little bit guarded um, outside the outside the U.S. because we are unknowing of the threat, but we know that we're being paced. You know, it's called a pacing threat for a reason, and. It's unfortunate that a large part of the target audience is so young because their minds are still developing. The primary audience that's on TikTok right now are 10 to 25-year-olds, and your mind's not fully developed until you're 25. So in the stages of learning, you're being fed one minute or less videos. So it's literally decreasing your attention span as you learn to learn. We had two people stand up today during our presentation and talk through their parental controls and the way that they've seen what happens when they take their um, their child off of TikTok or themselves off of TikTok just for 24 to 48 hours and the impact that that makes. Mm-hmm. You might feel withdrawals, you know, and I think that that's notable. You might feel better. You might feel kind of more clear-headed. There's there's a lot to note there. There's a lot to unpack, and that's why I think it's just good to talk about it. Yeah, I agree. And, and for me as a leader and as the, a different generation than what's entering the Air Force now, I see things differently. And, and um, I think it's important to say the sky's not falling either, right? And mm-hmm. so you guys do a good job through your presentations talking about that continuum. And, and, and for me, the most concern I have is just about the way the, these are platforms of influence. Mm-hmm. And so um, we can do things to defend our data. We can make good decisions. But in the end, somebody's going to consume something, and it's going to make them feel some way. And how do we get them to, like you guys mentioned, think about how that makes them feel and then make a behavior uh, decision or um, um, adjust their life based on what they think instead of what they feel. And, and so, so wrapping up here... Um, I tease at the beginning that we give give some folks some some good tips to help them out and some thoughts. So we'll just go around and um, give everybody an opportunity to um, say some closing words and then what you think from from your perspective you can offer for folks to um, take some advice and and make some some good smart decisions for them and their family. So let's start, Brian. Yes, sir. Uh- I'll say our adversaries want us to be fighting culture wars, not cold wars. Uh, So, you know, to to keep our eye on the ball there and remember to to stay safe online. You know, some of the the technical things that I recommend that you can take home with you uh, when you're browsing online to have, you know, some sort of ad protection on your browser uh, to limit the things that are that are popping up that are are able to track you. A lot of these sites like to use cookies to know everywhere you go and, and to uh, then serve you advertisements or collect information about your habits. You know, how often have you been on Nike.com looking at shoes and then you're on Facebook and getting all sorts of advertisements for shoes. 
so trying to limit that tracking with a safe browser or a browser extension. Uh, I won't mention any specific ones, but there's tons out there. Yep, just use a little, do some research and, and, and search around and, and then folks will find find some good. And, and of course, they can always ask a friend and, and, and have a conversation about what they do to protect themselves too. So as a, as a 14F, as an influence officer, most of the countermeasures that I employ are going to be influence focused, like checking, checking your tone on a post, you know, and understanding that that can have emotional reactions that draw in more inflammatory comments. Um, but it's, it's also uh, a, a neat tactic I've learned about recently is turning your phone to uh, grayscale because it's like it's almost like a slot machine you know it's very bright and pretty and it keeps your attention and if it goes to grayscale it'll keep your attention a little bit less so I think that's a creative countermeasure um, that you can employ I, um, I I think VPNs that you pay for are uh, are ideal as well I think lateral reading and fact checking is important um, so when I see something in social media, if I want to fact check it, I don't go to social media to fact check it. I go out <laughs> yeah. of social media to fact check it, for example. But above and beyond, it's just education. You know, um, there are podcasts, there are documentaries out there that you can look up to see. You know, how do I educate myself on influence operations or digital force protection? Um, and they're out there, and they're they're kind of what draw me in and make me think critically about how I post and remind me to take that, that inventory, that personal inventory before I post. So that's kind of my go-to list. I, uh, I think I've, I've modified, um, after first seeing some of the digital force protection things, like now I, I consider before I click like or, you know, provide a reaction to a post that I do think about it. Do I, does it really matter if I put a little heart on that or, you know, um, and, and I do find myself, um, if I have been on social media a lot, that I do find it affecting me. And, and so I will, um, very, um, uh, I can't think of the word, but I will take a, a, a break. I'll be like, nope, you know, and just take some time and say, I just can't go in there. Um, and that's, and, and just kind of, get away from it for for a little bit so yeah um. so for so for me i think um the one thing i offer i tell people that i learned um from being a coach and dealing with kids and parents is that the the one of the organizations i was a part of had a rule where there's 24 hour cooling off period so if you want to talk to the coach and, and you were angry about something you had to wait 24 hours and so I think that has helped me, and sometimes I need people to remind me at times when I get worked up about something, especially in this job. Even it's not necessarily social media stuff, just in my daily life about um, do I need to respond right now? Like it forces me to think, like, is it a response I need to do now? I'm obviously agitated, and, and I think that that is applicable to social media world as well. And so we saw one of our airmen beginning COVID. Um, gets sucked into Facebook argument. And that airman ended up saying, saying some things that they regret. They'd had a couple drinks while they were doing it, and they end up losing their job. Like, what you say in this space, um, whether you're in status of reservist or not, it's all, there's a nexus. Um, if you mention that you're a military member and you are out of line, like, we hold you accountable. And so take that 24 hours, think about, especially if you feel like if you're having a feeling where you worked up, just take a break from it. Maybe 24 hours is not for you. Maybe it's 12. Maybe it's tomorrow. Like whatever that is for you, I think that can really help. And if you still feel strong about it, then you probably got a clear head and, and, and maybe you dress it in a different way, but you, you, you attack the problem. So um, any closing thoughts from anybody? No, I just appreciate the opportunity. So I say no, and then I go to answer you. I know you love that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to to be vocal about this, to be invited to the wing here, uh, to talk with the 433rd, the 960th, the 419th, um, to talk with the spouses, and to talk with the children and the airmen. It's just – it's really awesome, and I mean that in every sense, both surprising and just amazing – to be able to connect with so many people on something that we, we have a lot of common ground on. Even if we're not on social media, we understand that that's a way to be connected. 
and there's there's reason to be cautious but we don't want to chuck it out the window entirely so i appreciate that you will you allow the space and the grace to kind of move together you know to figure this figure this out together so thank you colonel erridge and mrs erridge it's i mean it's it's amazing working with you all and and i just appreciate the opportunity to talk about this yeah it's really important to us and it's uh um it's easy to talk about i mean and and it's important from a readiness perspective for us to be ready our family's ready it's just one aspect it's one data point um but i think we need to tackle it in, in any way we can so i appreciate all the work you've done um both you um both here and there preparing i know it's a lot of work it's not your normal day-to-day -day jobs and so but it's important and so thank you thank you sir thank you sir